Um, good afternoon, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to the Monash Advanced Microscopy Seminar Series. Today, we have a seminar from Pia Larson. Pia comes to us from the Australian Centre for Blood Diseases, where she is a research fellow in the platelets and thrombosis group. She joined ACBD in 2019 and has worked with a team of imaging and analysis experts to develop novel intravital imaging and analysis techniques to study blood clot formation in the living animal, which she will share with us today in her seminar titled Decoding Blood Clot Formation Using Intravital Microscopy and Python-Based Image Analysis. Thank you very much for joining us, Pia. Over to you. Well, thanks, Steve, and thanks for the invitation to speak uh, on this for this audience. I will share my screen. Um, is that coming up for you? Yeah, all good. Cool. So again, thanks, thanks for for um, for letting me talk about the project that I've been working on over the last uh, four or so years um, about trying to get a better understanding of thrombus formation in, in vivo. Um, and I would, let's see, this is not right, that's not working. Oh, here we go. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the Boon Warang and the Wurundjeri clans of the Kulin Nation who are the custodians of the land and waters and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So first I would like to introduce you to the decoding team. And we, this team is divided into two parts. We've got the coders and the non-coders. Um, so the project began in 2018 when I was doing a research collaboration uh, with the ACBD. I was employed by a university in Sweden. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, Niklas Buknas was doing a, uh, a postdoc at the, the Institute. So he's also from Sweden, Linköping University, but so he's a fellow Swede. Um, and we sort of found each other at the ACBD and realized that if we combined our interests and our techniques, this could become a really interesting uh, project. Um, so uh, Niklas is a platelet researcher and uh, a medical doctor, so he doesn't really have a lot of imaging uh, expertise uh, background, and I didn't at the time either. So uh, we were very lucky to to get some other people on board on this project. And um, Abby McGovern, who is a PhD student from uh, Monash, uh, who is uh, in Juan Nunes Iglesias group. She joined the project after um, a year or so, and we're very, very happy that she's on board. She's doing an amazing job. And actually the stuff I will be showing today is mainly going to be about her work. Um, on the imaging side, we have uh, Volga Tarlak, who was a senior RA in our group uh, at the ACBD. Uh, unfortunately, she left the group a couple of years ago, but she was very important to in the establishing of the of the actual techniques and the imaging uh, in our lab. And then we're supported by a, a, a team of more senior uh, imaging and image analysis experts, uh, Steve Cody, who used to be the uh, the head of uh, MMI at our institute. Uh, he was very important in the first part of the project that I will talk about soon. And now Ishka is supporting us in our everyday struggles with the microscope. And on the analysis side, we're lucky to have Juan on board, who is a, an internationally very well-known uh, Python uh, image analysis expert. And also Lars Faxel from Linköping University, who was the person who actually started writing the code before Niklas took over. Um, so just a brief outline of the talk today. Um, I will start by giving an introduction about uh, why we think it's important to study thrombus formation in vivo. Uh, and then I will go through the methodology. Uh, so focusing on both the experimental side, so imaging platform and thrombosis model, and the analytical pipeline, which is four parts that I will go through. 
the deep learning segmentation uh, thrombovascular coordinate system, why this is important, um, go through the platelet tracking and why that's important, and then finally go through what type of data we can extract using this Python-based analysis and visualization tools that we got access to. And if I have time, there might be a bit of a bonus talk, which is um, sort of describing what we're doing at the moment, or what Abby is doing at the moment. Um, and that is going to be about how platelets coordinate in three-dimensional space to build a thrombus. So just briefly, um, I'm just going to go through hemostasis very briefly. So um, hemostasis is the system that we have in the body to keep the blood from escaping from a damaged blood vessel. And very sort of um, very briefly and, and sort of simplified, this system is often described as uh, three different uh, sort of different subsystems. We've got first uh, platelet accumulation uh, happening if we've got a tissue or a vessel damage, and this is called primary hemostasis. Um, and then this is followed by activation of the coagulation system and fibrin formation called secondary hemostasis, and then um, when the blood clot uh, needs to be removed, the fibrinolytic system um, kicks in to remove, remove the blood clot. And this is, of course, very simplified, and it's also got a very clear temporal sort of sequence in it, which is actually not correct, but this is, this is how it's often being described. Um, another part uh, that is important to think about when it comes to the hemostatic system is the concept of hemostatic uh, balance. So um, this is um, sort of the idea that we've got pro-coagulant or pro-thrombotic factors on one side of this balance and anticoagulant and fibrinolytic sort of um, antithrombotic uh, mechanisms on the other side of this balance. And if this balance for some reason is shifted, if it's shifted towards the pro-coagulant, pro-thrombotic side, we will get excessive clotting and leading to different types of thrombotic disorders. And on the other hand, if it's shifted towards the sort of more anticoagulant side, we will get in, uh, insufficient uh, clotting and, and bleeding disorders. Um, so I will just go through uh, very briefly thrombosis, uh, which is of course, when this balance of this sort of scales uh, has shifted towards a more pro-thrombotic phenotype. And when this happens, the blood clot that's formed in a damaged blood vessel uh, will grow and grow too large and eventually occlude that vessel, thereby cutting off oxygen supply uh, to downstream tissues and causing uh, tissue damage. And of course, if this happens in the brain, it's not a good thing. It causes an ischemic stroke. And if it happens in the heart, uh, it can cause a heart attack. Uh, and the main constituents of this so-called arterial thrombi is the platelets. Platelets are circulating small cell fragments. They are quite, quite small in, in humans, about two to four microns maybe in diameter. And in the mice, they're even smaller, about one to two microns. And uh, many of the antithrombotic drugs that are used today are targeting um, these uh, platelets. Uh, so there's a challenge here uh, when you're targeting platelets, because of course you wanna prevent thrombosis, but you still want to preserve hemostasis. And the currently used drugs um, that target platelets often target quite central platelet agonists, meaning that it's very difficult to find a balance here. So, so they, these drugs often come with uh, bleeding side effects. Um, so we believe that we still need to, to get a better understanding of blood clot formation, both to be able to optimize the use of current drugs, but also to identify new drug targets and develop more specific drugs for thrombosis prevention. So what we know about hemostasis and thrombosis today, well, like I sort of mentioned in that one first slide, um, we have had a tendency of compartmentalizing these systems into subsystems. So about the coagulation, for example, the coagulation system, we know a lot about how this system works. We know the factors, how they interact, uh, when they're activated and so on. 
And same thing with the platelets. We know a lot about how the platelets work, uh, what their different surface receptors are, their intracellular signaling, uh, their sort of contractile machinery, all that kind of stuff. And we also know, again, in fibrinolysis, we know all the factors, their activators, inhibitors, and so on. Um, and how do we know these things about hemostasis? Well, up until recently, we have mainly been using reductionist experimental models where we basically isolate one component of the system and we study that in isolation. So for example, we can look at the um, effects of soluble proteins in some kind of coagulation assays in plasma, or we can look specifically at um, uh, isolated blood cells. So like, for example, the behavior of platelets, the washed platelets in an agrogometry experiment, for example. And this gives us a lot of information about that specific system. Uh, but there has been a drive lately towards trying to include more complex sort of uh, models of thrombosis. So for example, this ex vivo whole blood thrombosis model that, that we're using, uh, where we sort of, we look at the effect of uh, a drug or something like that on the entire blood. So it's not an isolated system. And we also incorporate the effect of blood flow uh, in these systems. So this is, of course, a step in the right direction, but it's not reflecting, of course, the full complexity of an in vivo situation. So that's where the intravital microscopy thrombosis models come in uh, to play. So uh, intravital microscopy thrombosis models basically are where we image thrombus formation in real time. Uh, in the living animal, which is usually a mouse. And this has been around for a long time, but uh, there was a key sort of paper in uh, about 20 years ago from the Fury group, where they sort of used uh, these sort of laser, um, a fluorescent, sort of fluorescently based um, uh, microscopy methods to study thrombus formation in, in real time. And since that method was introduced, about 20 years ago, it's been adopted by several other groups in the world, including here at the ACB Day. And one of the main thing that has come out of this, um, this, um, these types of experiments is that when a thrombus is forming in vivo, it's not forming as a, a homogeneous mass of platelets. Uh, there's actually a structure to the, the blood clot. And um, it's been described as or named by the group that that sort of has mainly been working on this the core shell model and basically that this model is that we get this uh, structure where we get um, sort of highly activated platelets and fibrin at the very sort of base where the injury is in the vessel wall and then that is sort of, sort of overlaid by this shell of, of less activated platelets and the hypothesis is that this structure is sort of formed due to sort of differences in, um, in um, um, diffusion of agonists and things like that um, in, in the thrombus mass. Um, however, there's a couple of limitations uh, to this model that we have identified. Um, and one of the main limitations is that the vessel uh, injury that they use to sort of induce thrombus formation is relatively poorly controlled, uh, both when it comes to injury size, uh, severity, and location. Uh, up until now, most people use a pulse laser system called Micropoint to make these injuries, and some other groups actually use a physical needle puncture injury uh, to puncture the endothelial cells and, and start a, a thrombotic process. Um, the second uh, limitation is that there has been very little image analysis development in this field since this, this method was, was published 20 years ago. Most people still look at either a, a two-dimensional or, or a three-dimensional, so area or volume um, over time in these vessels. So this is just an example from a, from a study uh, published by, by the Bra uh, Brass and Stalker group in Philadelphia, where you can sort of see this core shell structure here. This is the outline of the vessel here. And we've got fibrin forming at the sort of base of the injury. Then we get this sort of um, core of highly activated 
p-selectin positive platelets and this shell of p-selectin negative platelets. And what they do then is they just basically look at the area over time for these different markers. And that, that's how they quantify from the size. So based on this, the aim of, of this uh, project was to develop improved methods or an, an improved method to study thrombus formation in vivo using intravital microscopy. And so basically we combine two different things here. We combine a novel thrombosis model for intravital microscopy that we call scanning laser induced endothelial injury. And this is the brainchild of uh, Steve Cody, who was the, the head of uh, MMI. Uh, and then uh, we combine that with this novel image analysis concept that is the brainchild of Niklas Buchnaf, who was the postdoc here at the ACBD. So I will just talk you through the imaging platform that we have at, at the ACBD. So we are using a Nikon A1R laser scanning confocal microscope. And, and this is a pretty standard system, but it is equipped with a couple of different things to make, make it work for what we're doing. So the main thing is that it's equipped with a 200 milliwatt for a five nanometer laser. Um, so I think the standard laser in these types of microscopes normally is about 50 milliwatts, so this is substantially uh, more powerful. Um, and this is uh, so that we can use it for laser ablation. And this uh, system has, as a default, two different uh, scanners. It's got a resonance scanner that's very fast that we're using for imaging, and the Galvano scanner, uh, which we use for the actual laser ablation using the, the four or five nanometer laser. Uh, we've also equipped this system with the PSO said stage to be able to move quickly in the said dimension. Mm, uh, it's got an objective that is very good for live animal imaging. And it's got uh, two standard detectors and then two very sensitive GASP detectors. Uh, so I just very quickly will go through this laser injury thrombosis model that we have uh, developed. Uh, so with this system or with this model, we're using mouse mesentery veins. And uh, for those of you who don't know what those veins are, it's these veins here that are draining the, the bowel of the mouse with blood. And because we're using an inverted microscope, it's a very sort of handy to be able to sort of lay out these, um, uh, these vessels on the cover slip and we can image, image them very clearly like that. And with the, um, the standard sort of um, experiment, uh, sorry, um, before we're going into the, the new type of analysis that we're doing, in the standard experiment, we inject antibodies into the circulation of the mouse. So we inject, for example, the fibrin antibody to look at fibrin formation and the platelet antibody surface marker. Uh, so basically we're labeling all the platelets in the mouse in situ in the mouse. And, and then we are uh, using this laser injury where we're, like I said, using the 200 milliwatt for or five nanometer laser in photoablation mode. And we scan this, um, this very sort of specified region of interest of the vessel uh, with our four or five nanometer laser. And uh, what we had to do basically was to optimize the size of this uh, ROI that we're scanning the laser power that we used and also the pixel dwell time. So how quickly the, the scanner is sort of scanning over this area. And hopefully this movie will play. Uh, I'll just explain what you see here. So this here is the outline of the vessel in gray. So that's autofluorescence in the tissue of the vessel wall. And the platelets here are labeled in purple. Um, and you sort of will see the platelets um, sweeping by. So here the blood flow direction is from the top right corner to the lower left corner. Um, so here you can see how the platelets are moving really fast uh, in the vessel and it's called the vessel, uh, the scan, the detector goes black and then you can see, and then it goes black, sorry, during the actual ablation. And then you can see platelets starting to adhere to this, um, this injured endothelium basically straight away after, after the ablation. Um, this is just an example of what the thrombi uh, look like. 
uh, we've got uh, the platelet marker here in blue and uh, the fibrin uh, in red. And again, the autofluorescence you know, from the tissue is the green. So you sort of see the tissue, the, the vessel wall in green. And just to give you an idea here that we get this very dynamic thrombus growth in the first three to five minutes. And then after that, it sort of gradually consolidates and forms this really nice uh, teardrop formed um, uh, thrombus. And same thing with the fibrin, it sort of keeps on growing up until around five minutes and it mainly accumulates around the edges of the, the injury. Um, I'm not going to go through the details uh, of the results of this. We published this last year, but I'll just mention for the benefits with this method compared to, to previous methods is that we get reduced variability in our data because we can deliver a standardized uh, radiation dose to a very standardized volume of tissue. Um, and also what was interesting and good, I guess, is that we saw very comparable results between different people when different people were using this, this model. And also that we those people required minimal training. Uh, the very important part that will be sort of uh, for downstream purposes when I, when I talk about uh, the analysis is that we get much more information about the injury here. So we basically, like I said, have this predefined injury geometry in size, and we also can get the exact position of, um, of the injury because the coordinates of the injury are also saved in the metadata of the file. So this is what a, uh, a thrombus looks like after a while. So this is probably about 20, 30 minutes after, after injury when this sort of structure or this architecture of the thrombus has developed. So here you can see in red, the fibrin, hazelectin, which is the highly activated platelets in green and all the platelets, the platelet marker in blue. And here is a emerged image where we peel back the different layers so you can get an idea of the structure of the thrombus. And we have fibrin here at the bottom covered by that dome of P-selectin positive platelets and then a shell of P-selectin uh, negative platelets. So then the question is, how uh, is this hierarchical thrombus structure actually established? Um, Another sort of question in the field that we've been thinking about quite a lot is how does the thrombus know when to stop growing? And if you think about it, this system, the same system has to be able to deal with a huge span of injury severity. It's anything from like a small ruptured capillary in your finger to like a severed artery in your arm or leg. Um, so there must be like so many control systems here that we don't think that we actually know about. Uh, and another thing is like, why do we get such a large intraluminal platelet plug? Uh, why is the thrombus forming in this way, uh, considering that there is a, this risk of occlusion? And we think that we need to study the system's biology of thrombus formation in order to understand these things. So um, systems biology basically is, uh, we're using that to understand the bigger picture of complex biological systems. So we're basically applying sort of um, physics and mathematical concepts to biology to try to get that understanding of the complexity of the system. And a sort of theme in systems biology is um, the, the concept of self-organization which basically means that in these complex, complex systems, there is an emergence of an oval or, overall order as a result of the coordinated interactions and actions of individual components of the system. And uh, since a thrombus is composed of millions of individual cells, we sort of think that we need to start studying how the platelets collectively behave to shape this sort of thrombus architecture. And as I've told you before, we sort of in this sort of level of organization type diagram here, we know a lot about the intercellular pathways, molecules, et cetera. We know a lot about individual platelets, how they behave, fibrin. But when we start coming up to these higher orders of organization, we 
don't really know what's going on. And we also don't know much about how these different systems interact to sort of shape that, that sort of hierarchical structure. So we think that we need to study thrombus formation in a new way to sort of be able to see these things. So therefore we have developed this novel image analysis concept. And it's basically to study thrombus formation from a platelet perspective. Um, and in order to do so, uh, we use fractionally labeled platelets, basically meaning that instead of looking at all platelets, we only have a subset of platelets in the thrombus that are labeled. So here, for example, you can see that here we've got a thrombus with about 2.5% of the platelets labeled. We can identify separate platelets in this this um, structure. Um, and that's sort of very different from when we're looking at all the platelets, when we can only sort of see the structure of the thrombus as, as um, a big sort of uh, one big structure. Uh, the other thing that we want to do is to track platelets over time to be able to sort of see how they behave over time to form these structures in the thrombus. And in order to do that, we use custom-made scripts written in the programming language Python to analyze this. And just for your information, uh, this concept was previously used and developed for in vitro use um, by Niklas's group in Linköping. So what we have tried to do is to uh, refine the concept and also to apply it to an in vivo situation. So the experimental pipeline that we're using to do this is we are uh, collecting blood from a donor mouse and then we wash the platelets from that mouse, label them, uh, and we usually, our usual sort of uh, experiment is labeling them with a surface marker, a platelet marker, and also a calcium dye. Uh, then we inject these labeled platelets into a recipient mouse and we inject around about 30 million donor platelets into the mouse, which gives us about 2.5% platelets um, labeled in that mouse, circulating in the mouse. And in this stage, we can also inject different types of antibodies if we want to look at fibrin or P-selectin or some other type of, of marker. And of course, we can also um, inject different drugs and inhibitors and things like that. And then we, we do this intravital microscopy using this scanning uh, laser-induced endothelial injury. And the imaging here that we're using is slightly different from what we did in the, the sort of previous slides where I showed you the whole thrombus. So basically here, temporal resolution becomes much more important because we want to track the platelets. So basically we do simultaneous four-channel acquisition. Uh, we do bi-directional scanning to uh, make things faster. We still have to do a bit of averaging uh, in order to reduce some noise. We do two micron set sections for a total of six, uh, 64 microns height to cover the height of the thrombus. And when we do this, we, it takes us around, uh, around three seconds to acquire one set stack. And we do this continuously for 10 minutes, which makes, um, which then generates in total 194 uh, set stacks for one experiment. Um, and this is just an example of what an ex uh, what I, uh, such an experiment looks like. Here, the platelets are labeled in blue, the fibrin is in red and the Cal 520, so the calcium marker is in green. And the blood flow in this video comes from right to left. Uh, and the video is played at about 30 times the uh, acquisition state. And I hope you can appreciate, so this is the region of interest that would scan. You can appreciate how dynamically the platelets are moving and accumulating around this, this injury. And also the fact that they're moving a lot against the flow, which I find really interesting that they, they can do that. And you can sort of see here fibrin coming up at the very base of this, this uh, injury. So then for the analysis part, what we do is we take this data from the Nikon confocal. So high time resolution set stacks in ND2 format, which is about 13 gigabytes per injury. 
And we use a, a Python package called MD2 Reader to sort of be able to import data in a Python readable format. And then we use Python for uh, analysis. And I will go through these things in more detail, but I'll just tell you, so the first step that we do is uh, deep learning based image segmentation. Then we do some rotations and adjustments of the coordinate system. Uh, we do platelet tracking, and then we do this analysis of platelet properties and behaviors using all different types of Python based uh, packages and tools. So the first, um, the first section that I'm going to talk about in more detail is the platelet segmentation. So when we started this project, uh, we used a pretty standard platelet or image segmentation pipeline. We used some denoising uh, differences of Gaussian, uh, applied a threshold and then did some watershedding. And this was based on the in vitro scripts that they had been developing in Niklas's lab in uh, Linköping. But then the question uh, came up, how do we know if the segmentation and tracking uh, are actually working well in the in vivo situation because it's such a different type of imaging environment? So Abby uh, developed a way to quality control the tracking and to determine if uh, there were mistakes and if so, why was there a mistake? And she... Um, basically came to the conclusion that the tracking is, is very accurate, but when there is a tracking error, it is because the segmentation is not optimal. And she found that this is mainly due to relative poor um, segmentation in the said dimension. So this is an example of uh, some platelet pixels in um, the, so this is the Z, uh, Z dimension and the Y dimension. And these are platelets that are most likely merged in Z that shouldn't be merged. So this is probably three different platelets. This could be two, et cetera. So then we uh, developed, or Abby and Juan uh, developed a new platelet segmentation uh, method based on a deep learning sort of uh, um, system. So what they did was that they adapted a neural network called UNET to work with our types of images. And then what we did was that we, we trained this UNET on a limited uh, training data set which is basically you first run the segmentation, uh, the unit segmentation, and then we do manual correction of, of the output of the unit. And this um, was performed using a star paint package that I think uh, Juan uh, wrote for this project. So basically here we can see this is a, a, a platelet that's moving very fast. So it becomes like a worm. And we're basically sort of filling in and telling it that no, this is not individual platelets, this is one platelet. And here we have two platelets that are likely merged. And here we tell it, okay, now this is supposed to be split. So basically we go through that process of painting platelet pixels, which is quite um, painful. <laughs> it took weeks of painting pixels. But once that is done and sort of the, the, the unit is retrained using this new, new data, it was behaving much better. And uh, we were able to run the segmentation on our full data set uh, using the uh, M3 supercomputer at Monash and then evaluate the accuracy of this uh, segmentation. And we did that by, again, manual proofreading of selected volumes. And this is an example of what it looks like. Uh, this is again, the same uh, image that I showed you before. So where the platelets are merged in the uh, said dimension. So this is from the first generation segmentation that we did. Uh, the corresponding uh, ground truth. So manual segmentation that probably myself or Volga was doing show that yes, indeed, this is actually three different platelets. This is two platelets, here there's three platelets, etc. And with the deep learning uh, output, we could see that it was performing much better than the original segmentation. 
method. So here again, it has recognized that these are three uh, different platelets, that these are two different platelets, etc. So this is just an example of what it looks like in 3D. Um, so uh, the deep learning segmentation in 3D. And Abby also did some, some quantification of the errors. And she basically found that uh, we have a segmentation accuracy of almost 99%. Uh, we got some under segmentation and some over segmentation, but the segmentation accuracy is actually really, really, really high. So then we get to the second part of the, the pipeline, which is coordinate realignment. So why is it important for us to realign the coordinate system? Uh, so we're calling this new coordinate system the thrombovascular coordinate system because we are um, expressing the coordinates relative to the injury and relative to the blood flow. And why this is important is that by expressing the coordinates in this way, it makes it possible for us to pull data from uh, different thrombi and even different mice and analyze aggregate data sets. So for example, we can average, uh, we can analyze and express, visualize the average of 15 injuries from five mice, for example. And this is just an example of, of a, an image where we've done that. So here is uh, the, you can sort of see the, the injury uh, zone or the, injure, the injured area in this gray disc. And here we can see the average distribution of the fibrin signal uh, in these 15 injuries. The fibrin is a measured variable. So we see that here in green. And then we can also see the average distribution of the highly packed platelet. Uh, in this case shown here uh, in blue, and uh, that's a calculated variable. So this is like a, a very um, central part of, of what we're doing. The other thing is that we can, of course, if we have every all the, the injuries sort of realigned, we can group platelets to study platelet behavior based on the position in the thrombus. So we can group platelets in any way we, we feel like really, but this here is just showing, showing an example of where we're grouping the platelets based on what we call isovolumes. So it's sort of like this onion-like uh, structure with sort of layers going out from the center out to the outer parts of the thrombus. And then of course we can look at things like how the platelets are moving, the packing density, activation state in these different layers. Another thing that uh, is, is important is, so in one of the projects that we're working on at the moment, we are interested in hemodynamics. So where the, the direction of the blood flow becomes very important. So here, for example, we can divide the platelets up uh, and look at platelets that are located in the center of the injury versus the anterior, lateral, and posterior part of the injury, which, and these regions are uh, regions which we, uh, we think are going to be exposed to very different hemodynamic um, sort of profiles. So just briefly how we do this. Um, so we basically, when we do these experiments, we try to always position the vessel in the same way relative to the direction of the scanner. So um, we always position the vessel diagonally across the field of view. Um, and this uh, then sort of, when we get the coordinates of the platelets, uh, when we have the, the vessel positioned this, uh, in this diagonal way, we get the coordinates for each object expressed relative to the field of view. So uh, we've got uh, an X and a Y, uh, coordinate relative to the field of view. So what we do is that we recalculate these coordinates. So, so they are expressed relative to the center of injury instead of the field of view. Uh, and we can do this, like I mentioned before, because we actually have the coordinates of the injury stored in the metadata of each, each file. And then we also rotate the vessel 45 degrees and recalculate the coordinates after that so that basically we can also take the direction of blood flow into account. 
And this is just an example of what this looks like. Basically, if we have a platelet here that in its normal uh, coordinate system has a, a coordinate system, a, a coordinate of uh, 400 in X and 250 in Y. First, we sort of express this coordinate relative to the center of the injury, which gets coordinates zero. And then we rotate this whole thing. So basically we get um, a new coordinate system where anything that's upstream of the center of injury is positive and anything that's downstream of the center of injury is a negative value. And that also means that we can look at things like uh, positive movements, like how much is the platelet moving against the blood flow, how much is moving with the blood flow and things like that. And the third part is the tracking. Uh, and I'm not going to go through tracking in great detail, but I'll just mention why it's important that we track platelets for these experiments. Um, and uh, of course, if we want to study movement of, of, uh, of platelets, movement patterns that shape from this formation, it's important to track uh, the platelets. But this tracking also gives us a lot more information uh, about from the stability and turnover. So basically, we can measure things like the average residence time, which is basically how long the platelet is associated with the thrombus for. Uh, we can look at things like uh, recruitment of new platelets when we can start tracking them and shedding of platelets when we lose track of them. Uh, so we can look at all these types of stability measurements uh, because of the tracking. Uh, and then we can also analyze thrombus dynamics from the platelet perspective. Um, for example, looking at how do platelets behave just immediately after making contact with the thrombus and things like that. Uh, this is just showing the tracking, um, an example of tracking and objects. And Abby also uh, looked at the uh, accuracy of the, the tracking and she found that the, the tracking was also very accurate with about a 1% uh, error rate when it comes to ID swaps. So basically both the segmentation and tracking are sufficiently accurate to really represent platelet behavior in these thrombi. And this is just a video uh, to give you an idea visually about how, how well the tracking is uh, behaving. So here we have, uh, and the object identification is behaving. So here we have the raw data, uh, basically an NIS reconstruction of the data. Here are the objects that we have identified. This is going to show the tracks. And here we have a combined objects and tracks. Um, uh, video and again the blood flow here is from right to left let's see if it's playing yep uh, so i hope you can appreciate here how extremely well we can identify these platelets and these objects uh, and we also have the calcium marker uh, here in the green yellow and if we also include the tracking uh, so here you can see the tracks and here we've got the combination of tracks and ob uh, objects. And you can sort of get the feeling that this is really sort of able to represent what's actually going on in the thrombus. So now to the last part, which is basically just going to go through uh, what types of platelet properties and behaviors that we can, we can measure with this analysis. So basically for each object that we identify, we get all these different um, readouts. So we can measure object size, so platelet size. We can measure fluorescence intensities of the different markers that we have uh, in the, the object. We can also measure object shape. Uh, we can also measure things that are localized in the environment around each object. So not necessarily in the object, but around the object. So we can look at, of course, fluorescence intensity. So like how much fibrin fluorescence is around each object, how many other platelets are around 
our object that we're studying, which will give, give us an idea about packing density, for example, of the thrombus. Uh, like I said, with the tracking, we can look at things like movement, uh, turnover. We perform different calculations to be able to, for example, express the, um, the percent of the movement, the total movement of the platelet that is a contractile movement, things like that. And we also use these Python uh, tools for data visualization and statistics. Uh, and this is an, a video that Abby gave to me, just showing the number of variables that we can measure for each platelet. So basically each column here is a variable, a, one sort of data point that we have about each object. So you, we're playing here, she's scrolling along, uh, and as you, I hope you can appreciate, we've got quite a lot of information about, about every, every platelet. keeps on going and here we go. So basically as sort of a, a summary uh, with this type of analysis, we can measure all these different things. We can measure uh, a lot of different, we get a lot of information about from the size and structure. Of course, the total number of platelets is reflecting of the, uh, from the size. We can look at the platelet distribution in different parts of the thrombus, like I said, in like the head of the uh, thrombus versus the tail of the thrombus. We can get information about platelet packing density in different parts of the thrombus. Um, we also get a lot of information about thrombus stability. Uh, we can look at, as I mentioned before, platelet residence time. We can look at percent unstable platelets, embolization number of platelets recruited, fraction of platelets recruited, etc. And for each individual platelet, we can look at where it's the platelet position. We can look at where it's positioned relative to the injury, like I've mentioned before, and relative to the blood flow direction, relative to the thrombus surface. Uh, we can measure things about the surrounding of the platelet. We can look at fibrin or piezoelectin intensity, for example. We can look at how far away it is from the nearest fibrin or piezoelectin. We can look at proximity to other platelets. And when it comes to activation, we can look at, of course, the Cal520, which is an activation marker, main intensity, max intensity. We can look at oscillations. And when it comes to movement, we can look at the velocities in all different axes, displacement, percent contractile movement, contractile velocity, things like that. So the data that we have acquired so far, um, well, we've got around about 20 treatment groups so far. Uh, we usually make around 15 injuries per group, which means that we have around 300 injuries which corresponds to four terabytes of raw data. Uh, we got about 200,000 observations of platelets per injury, which then corresponds to about 60 million observations of platelets. And like I showed you before, we can measure around about 70 variables per observation, which basically means that we've got a data set of 4 billion data points. And uh, we're currently doing two different uh, projects based on this data. Uh, one, in, in one project, we are uh, looking at the effects of a novel drug that has been developed by our lab. Uh, and we want to sort of see exactly what that drug is doing in the thrombus and how it compares to more standard and traditional uh, platelet inhibitors. And in the second part, we are looking at the system's biology of thrombus formation. And unfortunately, I don't think I have the time today to go through that part. That might have to be the, the theme of a different uh, talk. Uh, so I'll just uh, finish with a summary of the method um, and just remind you that the key features of the method are that we label only a subset of platelets. And by doing that, we can describe and quantify the behavior of millions of individual platelets and groups of platelets in a forming thrombus. We use high temporal resolution 4D imaging, which then allows us to track the platelets in 3D and also allows dynamic calcium measurements. Uh, we use a deep learning based platelet segmentation, uh, which gives us increased accuracy in the C split 
and more and also gives us increased accuracy in general for the deeper parts of the thrombus. We use a defined injury position, which allows us to express the position of the platelets relative to the injury, which makes it possible for us to analyze aggregate data from different thrombi and mice, and also to describe thrombus structure and platelet behavior in subregions of the thrombi relative to the blood flow. And we track platelets to get information about uh, thrombus development and stability and platelet behavior over time. And finally, we're using all this, we're doing all this using Python based analysis of the data. So I'd just like to stop and uh, here and give a massive thanks to uh, the people who've been involved in this project, especially Niklas and Abby, who are amazing, amazing people to work with and very, very talented and smart coders. Uh, Steve and Ishka from the imaging side, Lars and Juan from the analysis side, Justin for funding this project, and of course, my research group for, for help and support. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. That was amazing, Pia. That uh, amount of data is just overwhelming to uh, to us, I'm sure. I don't know how you do that analysis in there, but I'm sure Abby has worked out a beautiful method for that as well. Yes. We have a couple of questions in the chat, so we'll open it up. So the first hand up was from BT, so I'm going to activate your microphone. You can ask your question, BT. Your microphone is active. No, all right, I'm gonna close that one for a minute and go to, uh, I think it is Gemma. Gemma, are you there? All right, I seem to have messed that up completely. Um, <laughs> let's try one here. We have one. I will talk, uh, read out Rosanna's for a moment while I work out what's going on with that one. Uh, great talk. Any idea how platelets can stop against the blood flow? Are they anchoring on proteins? Do they express, upregulate, or upregulate adhesion molecules? Yeah, so I think that depends on where they're stopping. If they are stopping at the very uh, base of the injury, and they will be adhering to adhesive proteins in the wall. Um, but what's really interesting is the ones that are moving, uh, even stopping or even moving against the forces of the blood flow higher up in the in the thrombus. And this is something that that I've been fascinated about just from from the start, how they can actually do that. Um, and I mean, I don't have a, 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 an answer to exactly how they do it, except that it must be some kind of contractile. They're using collectively using their contractile machineries to sort of move up against the blood flow or stay stationary against the blood flow. Okay, thank you. Let's try again with VT. I'm activating your microphone now if you'd like to ask your question. Oh, once again, we seem to be missing. Steve, I think the problem is that VT remains unmuted. So, uh, muted. I don't know. VT, you also must mute yourself to speak. But if that doesn't solve the problem, I don't know either. Ah, huh? hello. Should be yeah, active. yeah. Okay, there we are. Perfect. Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't have a question. So. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> my hand was up. I will now lower your hand. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's go with uh, is it Gem on the Galaxy S21? Let's see. Can you hear me? We certainly can. Yes, okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, I had a question. I written a bit uh, as well. So yeah, thank you very much, Pierre, for your presentation. And uh, I think it's a very, very powerful uh, analysis tool that you have. Have you looked uh, of the for the difference between arteries and veins, and what kind that, of thing you see? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, at the moment, we can't use this method in an artery because of a few different reasons. Um, 
the injury model that we're using, the laser that we're using is not strong enough to make a, a good injury in an artery. And the other aspect of this is that because we are looking at platelet movement, everything is moving in an artery because everything is pumping. So it's becoming much, much more difficult to track the platelets in, in that kind of environment. So it's something that we would love to be able to do, but with the current system that we're using, we, we can't really do it, unfortunately. Perfect. All right. Uh, now, got. All right, Mr. Hand, as a day has a question in there, have you considered the arterial versus venous thrombosis due to shear flow? Uh, yes, so um, it's a very interesting question and it's quite a complicated one to answer, I think. But basically, uh, we are using veins or venules, uh, but what we're using is what we call high flow venules. We can actually see on when, when we're running these experiments, especially when we have the the fractional uh, platelet staining, we can get a visual um, idea of which of the veins that have a higher flow than others because of how they become sort of distorted in space when they go through the scanner. So we selectively use what we call high flow venules. And these ones are, we don't know the exact uh, sort of uh, shear rate in these these vessels, but they are it's it's not very low. We're guessing it's around maybe 500 inverse seconds, which is sort of more towards the arterial side. Uh, but of course, uh, there would be it, like I like I said to the previous um, the previous person who asked the question, it would be ideal to be able to look at this in an arterial model as well. We just don't have the tools to do it yet. Perfect. All right, next question is from Michael. I've unmuted your well, microphone, Michael. Hi there, Pia. Um, thanks for that. That was really interesting. Um, I, I was interested in you, you said when you started doing the donor platelets and you were looking at 2.5% or something, did you have to play around with what percentage of platelets to uh, get to use to, to be able to segment them well? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so that was one of the first things we had to, to optimize. Um, the original protocol that they had been using in vitro was 5%, but that was too high for us. We couldn't segment them well if it was 5%. And also, we don't want to go too low because then we're losing, like, instead of seeing, you know, uh, 200,000 objects, we will be seeing maybe 10,000 objects if we do, like, a really, really small uh, fraction of platelets. So we found that 2.5%, around 2, 2.5% was actually like the perfect sort of, um, uh, the perfect number where we still had lots of platelets objects that we could follow in each thrombus, but not high enough to cause problems with, with uh, segmentation. And, and with the Python um, program, you talked about running it on a supercomputer. Is that absolutely required? Or can you do these analyses on a normal PC or? Well, uh, a lot of these analysis I think we can do on a normal PC. I actually, <laughs> uh, I tried to run them on my laptop at one stage. I had the laptop on ice packs uh, in the <laughs> middle of the room. To Smoke coming out of it. Were, Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the, the majority of uh, the analysis, like the downstream analysis of like looking at all these different calculations and stuff, are actually done not it was only the segmentation uh, that okay. was done on the supercomputer but yeah. all the downstream stuff can be done on on normal normal uh, laptops and desktops thank you all right perfect thank you very much for the questions everybody i have a question for abigail if she's uh, she's still allowed to talk there um you showed the angle that you use for the blood vessel and that you rotated these things for some of of your coordinate tracking, but did you try the angle of the blood vessel to the angle of the scanner in the microscope in anything to do that? I mean, obviously you've got beautiful accuracy in your tracking anyway, but I just figure maybe if that, if that blood flow was in the same direction as that fast vibration of the resonance scanner, did you try anything like that to see any better accuracy? We, it's actually something we haven't played with. We, we've, we've thought about it 
uh, we've thought about trying to do a, a fine transformations um, to get the rotation a little bit more perfect because there is some, of course, 45 degrees is 45 degrees to within some degree of accuracy. Uh, so we do get some slight tilting, but it's not enough to generally affect our results or to generate too much noise in the data. So we've decided it, it hasn't been worth it thus far. Oh, no, I, I, I think what I meant was in the actual experiment itself in aligning the blood vessel on the microscope to, yes. the, to the X direction so that the fastest blood flow is in the fastest direction of scan. The scanner, microscope. yeah. Um, so maybe I can answer that because I'm the one doing the actual experiments. Um, the reason, the original reason why we started using it at 45 degrees was that we wanted to capture as much of the vessel as possible. So, of course, if we have it uh, diagonally over the, the vessel, uh, over the field of view, we capture a longer, a longer part of the vessel. Um, and then also when it comes to the tracking, like if we were interested in tracking the free flowing platelets, it's probably a good idea to do maybe what you're saying, but we are not really interested in those. We're interested in the ones that are like adhering to the thrombus and those ones are not moving fast enough to sort of, yeah, for us, for it to be worse to do that. Oh, fair enough, absolutely. You're getting a much better field of view. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. I haven't seen any uh, other hands go up. There's last chance to ask a question on this beautiful bit of work and, and remarkable analysis. No one else has a question, then I'll bring it to an end for today. And everybody, thank you very much, Pia, for your for your talk and to all your thank collaborators you. for that beautiful work. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. All right, I'll close up the session. Thank you very much for attending, everybody, and have a great afternoon.